you very much. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to be talking with you today about um, a set of uh, topics that are of great relevance to everyone conducting uh, research here at the U of S, as well as um, for all the classes that you'll be taking uh, within your career. And it is a topic which um, uh, recurs uh, frequently within the news, um, uh, within uh, our institution, and not infrequently within our department, um, as a point of uh, concern and discussion. And it has to do with the issues of, of academic honesty, um, integrity associated with that, and academic misconduct. Um, this may seem like a, a, a topic that's far removed from your concerns as a graduate student or as a student embarking on 400 or 405, but I would assure you that um, it's highly relevant and uh, that there are some textured aspects of what I'm going to be talking about today, which um, most certainly apply to anyone seeking to write up their work for, uh, for any of those classes or, or in your work as a graduate student. Within today's talk, I'm going to be situating this issue and, and highlighting uh, its, its importance, its relevance, and almost its preeminent, um, uh, preeminent stature as a, as a point of concern within academia, within the academy. I'll then be going on to discuss some particular issues that fall within this domain that often trip students up. In the latter part of the court of this uh, talk, I'll be hitting on particular recommendations, tips, examples that you're going to want to keep in mind when it comes to writing up your work, characterizing it either for an instructor within your courses or more uh, significantly yet, within the, uh, the sphere of scientific contributions and journals, conferences, uh, and, and uh, symposia. So I'm going to be touching on a lot of topics today that, um, that are ones that each year, it seems, uh, one runs across uh, difficult news of people who have run afoul of this. And some of the basic principles and basic tips I'll be suggesting could have saved people both uh, here at the U of S and worldwide a lot of grief. And I hope you'll take them to heart as far as um, uh, putting into place the, the processes, the, the extra uh, steps to take care that I'll be suggesting here. I'd like to start by way of situating this context setting um, to remind us of uh, the several thousand year history of academia, of, of the academy. Academies have, have uh, varied um, since uh, their origins in ancient India and Greece. Um, but one thing that's stood uh, firm and, and, uh, and, and very reliably about academia is that it sought to support inquiry, typically very reliable inquiry through, through reproducible methods into some aspects of truth, um, of, of uh, the nature of reality, the nature of uh, the sci scientific uh, processes that we try to characterize and that we try to discover through experiments, through logical reasoning, et cetera. And it supports the same journey through, through, through exploration and communication of ideas. And each aspect of this statement turns out to be, to be relevant for, for my subsequent presentation. This notion of reliably inquiry, this notion of, of maintaining a special uh, a level of attention and importance attached to uh, discovery and, and truth of the matter, despite personal cher cherished prejudices. And this issue of, of communication of ideas is also of foremost importance. Now, I could give a talk that would last much of a day within, within that broad sphere um, as it intercepts with uh, concerns involving dishonesty, um, uh, integrity, and uh, 
uh, and guidelines for for maintaining those highest standards of that in work. And uh, there's many aspects of this uh, documentation and, in fact, uh, rigorous thinking about the methodology you follow, making sure it's not haphazard and that how you followed it was clearly documented, that you've represented the work that you have conducted in a, uh, a manner that puts a preeminent emphasis on truth, however, however uh, inconvenient it may sometimes be, characterization of the findings of that work. Whole scientific careers have been derailed because of a lack of accurate description of what was actually found in scientific experiments, whether computational uh, in nature and in um, the life sciences on the bench side. Citation to indicate reuse where you've drawn on the ideas of others and explicit quoting and highlighting of things where you've reused expressions of those ideas, ways of, of characterizing. Because this is such an expansive topic, I'm only going to have a chance today to really meaningfully engage about the latter two of these. I'd be happy to discuss some questions and have dialogue about the first three, but I'm going to be focusing my presentation today on this issue of citation and this issue of, of giving proper acknowledgments when we're drawing on the ways in which ideas are expressed, whether it's through an image, whether it's through um, verbatim text, or in some other means. Again, happy to, to talk about the, uh, the first three, which are as foundational and important, but trip students in this department up less commonly. So I'd like to introduce here a word that will follow us through the presentation um, and, and to make sure that we're on a common page in understanding it. And it has to do with this, this word plagiarism, which you've probably heard. Um, you've certainly seen it in the context of course outlines or curricula in the context of your courses by stipulation of, of uh, uh, UFS policy. But it, it, it's a situation when we represent another's ideas or expressions of those ideas as if they were our own. We, we appropriate this, um, uh, the idea itself, and, and treat it as if it was something we originated, we developed it, um, or the expression of it. Uh, we perhaps use some text from others which were their words. There are a couple sentences that crisply describe the idea but we, we fail to explicitly acknowledge that. Now to understand why plagiarism is such a, uh, a large scale issue requires attention to a couple things. The first thing is why is it important? And the second thing is why is it, why is it so common in today's circumstances? Why is it that every year variety within our department, within courses, it becomes a sufficient enough issue that students are penalized through it and occasionally expelled from the institution. Now for the first of these issues, the issue of why is it important, I want to I talk about this notion of academia as uh, supporting reliable inquiry into truth uh, through exploration and communication of ideas. The environment in academia, the environment in universities and in research institutions has a certain logic to it, a certain um, underlying dynamic to it, which is different than the logic uh, we see in much commercial activity. It's not to say that it's diametrically opposed to it by any means. In fact, the two can work together well. But there's a different sort of semantics and, and, and ways in which the academy works. And one of the foremost features of it that really distinguishes it from the external world is that it, like commercial context, is characterized by an economy. But it's an economy not of money, not of currency, but an economy instead of ideas. Ideas in academia in many ways constitute the unit of value, the unit of, of the currency, as it were. And academia's long cherished those ideas because as a way of, of recognizing 
uh, progress and, and, and new discoveries and new thinking, new ways of, of providing specific clarity to particular topics or understanding. So ideas and ideas that capture the truth of a situation, whether it has to do with computer science or chemistry or biology or physics, are viewed as, as, of, as of utmost importance within the context of, of the academy. And those who contribute to those ideas that, that shape them, that uh, make new discoveries, that, that characterize things with particular clarity, are seen as making a real contribution. And the academic value system places a premium on, on evidence of that contribution. So the fact that I contribute a new algorithm, or the fact that I contribute a new architecture, or that I make the discovery that this particular methodology is exceptionally powerful when coupled with this sort of data. That is seen as, as a contribution and one that's worthy of, of recognition. And the ways in which this is recognized is through citations and acknowledgments of a person's contributions. So when I contribute some discovery or I contribute a way of explaining that discovery that has particular power or, or strength to it, the way in which that's acknowledged is, is I get cited for it. I get acknowledged for my contribution. And these acknowledgments all come in various forms, but typically it's in the form of papers or books or, or talks where, where that's explicitly cited, it's explicitly referenced. And as such, use of those ideas or that expression without that acknowledgement um, constitutes here something that at a certain level is, is similar to theft. I'm borrowing from your ideas, but I'm not giving you credit for them. I'm taking what's valuable from you, but I'm not giving you any, any uh, not, not distributing any evidence that this is indeed from you. Much as if someone had stolen something from me and were, was, was using it as if they were, it was their own. Now, I want to highlight a feature of the external world that you may never have really thought about. And in today's context of, of a global economy, um, it may seem, at a certain level, a bit curious and, and even quaint. So there's a process in the external economy that's known as counterfeit. Counterfeiting uh, may conjure, that word may conjure images in your mind of, you know, printing out, printing out, you know, thousand dollar bills or producing fake loonies or what have you. But fundamentally it consists of fraudulent substitution of fake currency for the real one. Right? It's, it's putting out what seems to be currency um, and substituting it for, for genuine currency. This has been a major problem through history, um, you know, where uh, coins that are fake lineage um, are substituted in, or or uh, or the paper currency, and it's seen as a major issue historically because it undercuts the wealth of everyone else who has real currency by lessening the worth of of, of currency holdings. It's actually a law in in, in uh, economics. It's called Gresham's law. Um, bad money drives out good. And the idea is that um, here that, that the introduction of false currency can have really adverse impact on people's holdings of, of real currency, can affect the whole system. And indeed, by the introduction of false currency, my real currency is worth less because there's all this fake stuff being circulated, right? Counterfeiting seeks to fraudulently benefit myself at the expense of others. Uh, and within an economy, um, this is very easy to perform technologically. These days, you know, someone can set up a, uh, a, a printing shop and print, you know, fake US $10 bills without foremost difficulties. But it carries the most severe of penalties. And some, 
In some countries, it carries capital punishment, meaning one's punished by, uh, by death. In other, in other economies, it can lead to lifetime imprisonment. For what? For putting out copies of this, of this currency, copies of $10 bills. How can it be? Well, because it debases everyone else's currency, because it steals from everyone else, and because a clear standard is needed of what is real currency for the economy to function, for the economy to work, there needs to be clarity about what's actually genuine and worthwhile and what's, what's fake. Now, I want to bring this back, this observation of the importance of, of counterfeiting and, and the severity with which it's regarded in the economic sense. And I want to turn to the economy of ideas that constitutes academia. I would argue that intellectual dishonesty, and particularly here, failing to cite the source of ideas and expressions of those ideas amounts to intellectual counterfeit. And it amounts to producing faux currency, fake, fake currency that debases the real one and that, that prevents the economy of ideas from, from operating in, in a uh, smooth fashion, just as counterfeiting does within the world of, of a real life currency. It undercuts the sort of counterfeiting, and failing to, to cite when I'm using your idea or your expression of idea, it prevents the creators of those ideas or expressions to be acknowledged for their contribution, to be provided with a credibility that extends from that acknowledgement, the fact that when they say something, you, it should be listened to, it, it has merit, it has gravity to it, and to be more broadly acknowledged um, for, their, uh, for their more, more, uh, more um, broad contributions beyond those, those particular ones that I'm, I'm borrowing from. Now, beyond those issues, within uh, the context of plagiarism, um, are a set of other consequences for other researchers. Besides, besides um, uh, hurting uh, the individual whose ideas you're taking, the, the subject of that theft, just like with counterfeiting, everyone loses, uh, everyone else loses. With intellectual failure, with intellectual dishonesty, failure to cite the source of ideas or expression of those ideas, there's a lot of broader consequences. It debases the economy. It prevents the economy from functioning well. Well, one example of that is that other researchers may engage less, less efficiently in their scientific efforts because the ideas aren't being led back to the real source of them, who's more reliable in their, in their, uh, in their um, discoveries or in their communication of them. They're, they're, they're working in a backwater where really they can go, be going to the source. There's often an opportunity cost associated with that. They could have been listening to the source of those ideas, but they missed it, and they end up, therefore, sacrificing some opportunities. These first two are particularly acute problems in the context of where data is falsified or data is, is, is made up or you know uh, some, some way in which the research has been conducted has been misrepresented, in which case you can really send people off you know, in a bad direction. You say cold fusion has occurred here and hundreds of millions of dollars pours into reproducing it where you know, there's nothing like that that actually occurred. Or you say, you know, measles vaccination causes autism, and you make up some data to substantiate that, that purports to substantiate it, and people end up making life decisions and engaging in research lines that, that are ultimately based on nothing but a lie. And you know, societal investment um, is often, um, often diverted from worthwhile areas as well. Now, the issue here, when it comes to counterfeiting in the, in, in acad in the academy, in, in, um, uh, in research, extends not merely to ideas, to using someone's ideas, but using their way of expressing those ideas. It turns out that expressing ideas with clarity 
with conciseness and with power is challenging. And communicating an idea with those characteristics succinctly and precisely, whether it's in text or through a compelling image or visualization or, or figure, um, is a real contribution that goes beyond the idea itself. And it gets to the heart of this issue of the academy is supporting communication. And it can require a lot of thinking, a lot of effort, and a lot of time to really come up with the ways of, of clearly communicating. Often adapting that description to communicate to this audience compared to that one requires a great deal of, of insight. And for these reasons, we reward people for their contributions in this area. In this, area. this is seen as making a real contribution just as making some new discovery is, and we reward people with citations. We reward them with acknowledgments that they were the source of this way of expressing things. Not merely the ideas, but the expression of them. And this can extend to text, it can extend to images, it can extend to arrangements, um, the need for, for acknowledgement. Now, each year within our department, and many times across our university, students run afoul of this. They fail to cite, they fail to acknowledge the source of an idea, the source of an image, the source of some code. And there are consequences for the broader economy of ideas that I've been speaking about, the economy of ideas that, that lies at the heart of the search for truth represented by the Academy, represented by universities and research, um, uh, research institutions across the world. But there's also personal consequences for the individual who fails to, fails to sufficiently acknowledge. And we'll come to why it's so often discovered. But amongst other things, one consequence that often run, they often run and follow is a loss of trust. As in the economy of currency, trust is central to a well-functioning economy of ideas. We don't really think about this day-to-day -day in economic sense. When we go to shop, for example, just how much more efficiently things run because of an element of trust. How much more efficiently a store runs with the confidence that people aren't going to be able to make it extraordinary efforts to sneak things out through devious ways to hide them under their clothes or what have you. And occasionally you'll read stories about situations where standards that worked in one area didn't work in another and the loss of trust led, led to a real set of inefficiencies being introduced. So it is with the graduate relationship, and indeed 400, 405. A loss of trust with the supervisor, with a committee or, or colleagues can really lead to big implications with the efficiency with which you can pursue your, your life as far as conducting research. Uh, suspicion, a lot more, a lot slower review of things, and sometimes to things like shunning and lack of interest in someone's part in assisting you because they feel that they are being put at risk or they are wasting their time for someone who's not listening carefully or not really listening to guidance. But a lot of what that loss of trust is about is because of the consequences for the supervisor knowing what would happen if these same standards that may lead to a discovery, say, of plagiarism in a, in a 405 paper or in a, in a uh, contribution from a student that would go into the thesis, what would happen if that made its way into the external world? And the real risk here, and it's occurred many, many times, is the destruction of academic careers. Not just on the part of the student, but on the part of the supervisor. Some famous figures within the scientific realm who have been at pinnacles of, uh, of, of personal success have far, fallen afoul of, of uh, 
misbehavior on the part of their students. And it found their own careers sabotaged and led to loss of position, loss of status, loss of regard by fellow faculty. So the risk here is the student's putting the supervisor at risk. Not, not really the student putting themselves at risk, but the supervisor at risk of being accused of misconduct, being accused of sloppiness in their scientific uh, pursuits. And as a result, it naturally leads to a, a lack of loss of trust because the student is viewed as having, having undertaken actions which callously and uh, rashly um, put the, the supervisor at risk. It can also lead the student, and this happens probably at least once a year here on campus for being expelled, or for even, even worse, having degrees revoked. One of, one of the foremost nightmares PhD students sometimes have is, right, they graduate, and then someone comes to them and says, guess what, you're not done yet. You got to do more work, <laughs> and you know they have to go back. What's worse than that is they come and they say, "Guess what? Your degree was unwarranted. I'm taking it, and you know, good luck for the rest of your life." Um, these things do go on. Um, they've gone on in the halls around us. Almost of equally painful of, of equally painful is being summoned before faculty committees. Many of you are graduate students. I can't tell you the level of angst I've seen within these committees where I've been summoned as a faculty witness and see a student testifying under the, the cold stares of a bunch of faculty being asked to explain how these copied paragraphs made their way into their paper for a class I taught or made their way into their thesis. Sometimes that comes before they're expelled Often it comes as part of a very uh, embarrassing reprimand and in the context of loss of trust. And unfortunately, people who find this happening to them, the whispers go out and often it greatly sabotages their career. The faculty member who's mentored them for so long can't even with full heart recommend them to colleagues, for example. Can you speak? Yeah. So Sometimes when I'm looking at things and I've read somebody's work for a couple of months and I see a paragraph that's so much better than anything they could have written, my spidey senses go up and I go, hmm, wonder if they actually wrote that themselves or somebody else did. And then I copy and paste those lines into Google search and it comes up with, hey, somebody in 2004 wrote this paper in a journal and I go, Exactly. There, the trust is gone. You know, um, maybe people get one or two, but you don't get three strikes even with your relationship with your supervisor because they go, "Do you think we're stupid?" And I'm sorry, I'm being really fast about this, but it, it basically comes down to that: Do you think we're not going to find out? And if we don't find out, our career is on the line. If it goes to publication, if it goes to publication, that original author of that paragraph sees it, or one of their students see it and say, "Hey, that's my that's my supervisor's text. That's not these guys' text. These folks are nothing but frauds. I mean, they're 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 stealing text from people. Careers can be ruined. Careers can be ruined. The the grants can be yanked." Um, you know, the, uh, the career of the supervisor, not just of the long vanished student, can be direct. And unfortunately, like Dwight, this has occurred quite a few times to me. And every time the loss of trust, if it's a student handing things in to me, is profound. For a thesis, for example, it turns from being an asset, something that's a real contribution, to something that, that's filled with potential bombs. <laughs> You're know, like, is this paragraph safe? Is this one safe? If any of them are off, my career could be put in jeopardy. And I feel like, at the least, a, um, someone is working on diffusing a ticking time bomb, not knowing if I've missed something that could end up causing major problems. 
levels. And it leads to, unfortunately, permanent issues, typically, between the faculty and the student involved. My personal experience with this has been profound. Um, I've had to report infractions. I've spoken with students who, where I've discovered this as being an issue and had those heartfelt conversations. As Dwight says, at most one, maybe twice, probably one time, and after that, you know, it's clear, it's repeated, deliberate, despite the strongest of exertions. I don't want anything to do with the student. Fund the student? You gotta be crazy. I'm gonna fund you to give me something filled with time bombs? Um, not gonna happen. I've been asked to give testimony to disciplinary boards here. Um, I've had consultation by authors on multiple occasions spotting potential plagiarism where they believe their words were taken by someone else. And they come to me and say, what do you think? There's a few words here changed here and there, but it's similar enough. Or they'll say, you know, the words are a bit different, but it's this ordering of the paragraphs, you know, hitting this, this, and this, and this, and a lot of the words are the same. I think that's plagiarism, and they'll come and they'll consult. Or supervisors finding this possible confabulation by the student. What do I do in seeking out guidance? Uh, I've also had the unfortunate experience of, me, of finding these paragraphs. I suspect it's not just why you're I. The faculty here are very good at spiting sentences. I've had, um, I've had fellow faculty members say, how did you possibly discover this? What plagiarism detector did you use? I used this one. You know, you read it, you just get this sense, okay, this, this isn't how this student writes. It isn't how this student expresses things. And it can pick up very subtle signs that lead you on to something. Um, this has led to big challenges with me personally. When I was a pre-tenure faculty member, I spent quite a lot of time on a book co-authored with, with uh, a set of co-authors based around a course that I had taught back at MIT. This is a serious effort on my part. They, they thought the course contents were excellent and they wanted to turn it into a textbook in the field. Which I was flattered by, and I, I know spending a lot of time. One of them said, okay, they're going to take the lead on this. This was not an MIT faculty member. It was someone who had come in um, to, as a visiting faculty member, and he said he was going to take the lead. And when the book was largely together, it was just getting refined, I discovered a paragraph that was taken from a website. Then I discovered a few more paragraphs. I said, what the hell is this? What is going on? You know, this wasn't from my course materials. This was taken places. So I, I brought it up to the co-author. And the co-author said, oh, you know, I, I meant, I'm, I'm going to replace that text. Don't worry. But there was no indication in the book text that it was different text, that you know, it, was, it was transitional text or, or, or text that was uh, just a placeholder. I ended up relinquishing authorship of that book. That book is published, you can find it on Amazon, it sells well. And for my course at MIT, I don't have anything to do with that book. I said, do not acknowledge me, do not mention my name in this book. I, I want nothing to do because it will destroy my career. And I was advised on that front by other faculty. It's that led to sacrifice the lines of collaboration things that seem to be going really well, we were doing great research, and I just said, I can't do this, there's plagiarism issue here, I've discovered the faculty member does not seem determined to actually get to the heart of it, I can't, I can't afford this, and I've terminated my committee membership, so I've had to leave committees precipitously um, because repeated concerns have not led to uh, fixes that stay fixed. And unfortunately, I have been involved in a student expulsion from the U of S because of these concerns. Now, for those who, whose English here is not their first language, I'd like to make an observation. I know that many of you feel you struggle with English. I know that you feel that there's vastly better English out there that you could borrow from 
and come up with something closer to a finished product. I view as part of my job, and it's one of the preeminent and repeatedly exercised parts of my job to actually help you with England. You may say, well, you're a computer science professor. What are you doing helping you with English? Well, I happen to love the language, but more than that, it's part of the thinking process to help a student work their way through expressing things with clarity, and it develops their skills. It's an asset that they come to have, to be able to express things well and crisply. And it is, I know you, you probably think it takes work. You know, I have to modify every sentence and adjust the tenses and put in the articles and put in the commas and all that sort of stuff. You may think that that's a terrible imposition on your own advisor or your own committee or, or on myself. But, you know, I would rather spend millions of hours doing that they come across a case of plagiarism. Millions of hours. I mean, it's incomparable. This is part of my job. It's something that I, I enjoy doing to, to strengthen the student. Even if it's for those faculty who think it's a burden, it is so much lighter a burden than, than you know, dealing with plagiarism that they would, in a heartbeat, you know, rather spend large amounts of time um, correcting. And I will highlight for you that, you know, if you, if you think about the process of passing on writing, particularly as a, as a graduate student, if there is something taken without proper citation, without proper acknowledgement for ideas or expressions, like this picture, um, uh, uh, wording, it needs to pass before a whole gauntlet of, of different individuals. It has to pass before your supervisor, the committee typically. The College of Graduate Studies will be looking for indications of possible misconduct. I found the College of Graduate Studies to send back theses on committees I am where they highlight possible concerns. And they say, look, this phrase of five words, that phrase is not quoted. And, and we find it in 20 other articles. Why isn't that cited? Why isn't that quoted? And that needs to be addressed by, at the least, by the faculty member. It's much worse if they find anything larger than that. External examiners will be looking. This is I've served in external examiners worldwide on, on different committees. And if an external examiner finds someone from outside the department, and particularly someone from a different institution for PhDs, if they end up finding some text that's not yours or not properly cited, typically they will bring down the hammer. And then they don't want anything more to do than to say, you know, this is this is fraudulent work. I'm not going to take my time to read this. Because you're asking them to volunteer their time. And they're going to say, I don't want anything to do with this. You know, go jump in the lake. Here's the thesis back. You know, why isn't your supervisor babysitting you properly? You know, this is not worthy stuff. And it's a very sharp judgment, but it's a judgment that external examiners aren't are going to make because they are being asked to volunteer their time for this student, presumably worthy work, and if they find that it's concocted with other people's text, it will be a problem. And then finally, if, if your work gets to publication, which I hope it would, readers, people who, who, who are reading the work, often, often that includes any people from whom that text might have been taken because they're working in related areas. And if they see this, They'll say, that's my wording. That is my wording. I recognize that. And you'll have help to pay if, if they discover the wording taken, taken um, uh, by others without acknowledgement. So a couple, couple factors here. Look, if even small problems are discovered, you know, a, 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 and I would say actually this is pretty substantial, but a sentence is taken. Um, you may say that's all. 
That's all there is, it's just that sentence. How do I know it's all? If you, if you put that in there, how, how do I know that your word has suddenly been debased in my mind? I, I don't know whether it's addressed you. I mean, why didn't, why didn't you fix that? I mean, you knew it was so important, but you put it in there anyway. How do I know your comments as the only thing are worth my trust? You've lost, you've lost this trust, and I'm going to really, really doubt that. And you know, continuity of advising or collaboration or committee membership it has a huge risk. That committee I walked away with because of plagiarism issues. I did not want my name in front of it. And in fact, graduate studies threatened for one committee I know, where this was not a one-time issue, it came up twice. The student was discovered, they did it, they, they, it was found, they said they fixed it, and it came up again. The committee members for that committee, and I've heard this on reliable grounds, were threatened to have their graduate studies uh, certifications withdrawn, so they could not supervise any future graduate students. Is there, that was right here at the U of S. So the committee members, because they had missed this thing in a way that grad studies found it, were told essentially, for the rest of your career, we won't allow you to, to supervise graduates if this happens one more time. Needless to say, some of those committee members left. So I will further note that even small concerns can lead to a large amount of added work on your place, like demonstrating that it is everything else has been thoroughly cleaned, going through each sentence and making sure it's not an issue. And finally, the faculty may decline to, to consider continued work on this. Time is very precious for a faculty member, and they want to put it into people who will learn from it, will benefit from it, are worthy of their attention. And if they're finding these sort of problems, they're going to say, you're not worthy of my trust, much less my attention. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to work. Now, the scary thing here for a student is, and I'm sorry to say, just like ignorance of the law is no excuse, ignorance of the rules here is, does not constitute an exemption. In short, listen carefully to this talk. It's important. Lack of intention to take without attribution doesn't excuse it. If you copy these things into your text and you meant to go back to them and you simply lost track of what was copied in, that's sloppiness. It's not... It's not something that excuses you from it. It's, it's negligence. It's, it's negligence at a profound level in terms of um, the, the proper conduct of research. And you'll be slammed just as hard for that. Um, if the material is not central to your thesis, suppose it's a literature review, a stinking literature review. You're, you're trying to describe what other people have contributed. Don't you want to take from their abstract sometimes? No. No, 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 no. The faculty member, first of all, will take it as an indication that you don't, you haven't really seriously engaged with it. You haven't really read it and to the degree that you can express it yourself. It shows a shallowness of, of appreciation for that work if you, you can't even try to express it in your own terms. Literature reviews are one of the places I see this sort of plagiarism most commonly because the words are out there and the students are tempted to get them and put them into the thesis. But it's an area that is especially scrutinized, suspect, that is closely read by the committee and others, that is closely read by the people whose work you're citing to see whether you've expressed it well. And if you have anything that you've borrowed in there, chances are someone will find it. And they'll find it fast. They'll say, I just read that paper last week. Or that was my paper. And that's my wording of it. That's exactly how I expressed it. And you can't use that as your own. What sort of supervisor do you have that would let you do this? It's, so, so literature reviews are something you absolutely need to express. Something. Do it in broken English. Great. Give me broken English. I will, I will help you with turn it into polished English. So much better than having to deal with a fear of, of this. Um, another issue we've run into, I've, I've seen on several times, is passages that differ through just occasional changes. So you have a paragraph from this paper or this book 
for this other contribution. And then there's the student's version, and a few of the words have been substituted with synonyms. Plagiarism. It'd be viewed as plagiarism. Do we see this in grad students writing their own reference letters for applying to the program? And about <laughs> 10 years ago, I was talking to uh, somebody who was a friend of my parents, and I said, well, I'm trying to accept a new grad student as you do and this is the, this woman from a country that I will not name later, and it's not it's got anything to do with her gender. You know the students write them all these letters themselves, don't you? And like, well, yeah, I kind of have some suspect, suspicion that that's what happens. Because unfortunately, some universities, the supervisor does, or the person writing the reference letter doesn't have time, and they'll sign something to say, go write something for me and I'll sign it. And you really need to write three separate letters if you're going to be telling somebody, this, this, this student is the best I've ever seen. That exactly changes synonyms. I see it so many times. I'm, a, I'm not accepting that student. Yeah. You can't even write three separate letters, knowing that that's the only way to get in. Yeah. You should obviously you should be writing your own reference letter, but if, you're, if your professors or your bosses won't do it, yeah. it's still plagiarism, but at least make it harder to do Maybe there's another faculty member in the department or someone else across campus, and you take their text and you put it in, into the punishment. You're setting yourself up for a, for a fall. Um, they'll discover it and call you on it quite likely. Um, uh, you know, you you don't want to say, well, it's a thesis I'm taking from. It's not a published work. It's a it's a thesis. It's not a it's not a journal article. It's not a conference paper. It's just a thesis. I'm just borrowing some text in the thesis. No, no, no. That, that is a contribution, I hope, the thesis. I hope all of your theses are contributions. And I hope you're acknowledged for every bit of unique expression and ideas that went into your thesis. Borrowing text from a thesis does not make it OK. Um, or saying that oh, it's, it's, the original source lies in the public domain. It's code. You know, in GitHub, and I just I, I, I took the code and used it. Um, it's in the public domain. There's uh, there's an MIT license with it. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's not protected by copyright directly. No, that's that's not okay. You should at least cite and say it's been taken verbatim from here, um, or only part of the document is affected. The remainder is original. You know. The literature review is OK. I mean, that, that's, that's really problematic. Because once the trust is violated with your committee or with your supervisor, how do they know the rest is OK? They, you can have all the assurances up and down. It's not going to be clear. OK, a couple of key points here. Academic integrity concerns are different from intellectual property concerns. And intellectual property concerns are things like involving infringement of copyrights or patents trademarks, etc. That's a different set of issues than when I'm talking about academic integrity here, um, about expressing things with citations. Here we're talking about the economy of ideas. Trademarks and copyrights and, and patents are about an external economy as it links in with that economy of ideas. But, but here we're talking about, about citations as acknowledgments that don't have direct monetary implications. Merely using ideas, this is a key point. Using ideas from a source does require citing. If you are using an idea from some source that you found, uh, you found, and, and it's, 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 a, it's not an idea that's in countless sources, but it's, it's distinctive to that source or some, some um, subset of the literature, you should cite it, that you've drawn this inspiration from there. 
That doesn't lessen the worth of your work by, by no means. It just helps other people know you're building on top of reliable foundations, typically. Um, you know, you might want to uh, associate with that uh, an, an explicit look at the literature to see other things that have had it, but at the least you want a reference that matches that citation in your bibliography. And you know, the specific style of the citations and references will differ by venue. So if you're publishing in an IEEE conference or an ACM conference, you're publishing in a, a conference in mathematics, you'll have somewhat different uh, rules for how, how exactly they want to phrase the citation. For example, with a number or with a, uh, a certain naming of, of the authors and the date, et cetera. Um, I will note that reworking of text by a student represents a learning opportunity. Think how to express this well, just like teaching, forces you to, to better understand uh, the material often and, and make sure you, you really do understand it through uh, scrutiny by your supervisor. And using an expression beyond ideas will require something more than just using ideas. Using ideas will draw on, for example, um, uh, citations like that. If you are reusing expressions of ideas, you want to provide an explicit indication more than a simple citation. You want to say, for example, we're using a derivation or we're using an exposition, an explanation similar to this other article, we'll say following so-and-so we're going to provide this derivation. Or adopting the notation of so-and-so to indicate we're, we're using their way of, of characterizing the relevant <coughs> variables, the, the names or the, the symbols used for those. Or you'll say image taken from Y, from a certain source. Or image modified from this source. You've taken that image and you've modified it, you've cropped it, you've added a few things or what have you. And for text, this is absolutely central you want to put quotes around text for small bits, or for larger bits, you should basically set them clearly apart. So they're in a paragraph or paragraphs by themselves that are indented, for example, put in italics. It's very clear to someone looking at it that is, that is a different sort of text than the body of the documents. So these citations, whether for ideas or, or for uh, expressions, help, help your supervisor. No, if you're consulting reliable work, uh, helps other researchers by alerting them to reliable sources, which are really valuable. And it allows for, um, for other researchers to, to be able to assess, yes, do you know what you're doing? So I provided some examples in here. We're, we're running up towards the end of this session, but uh, for example, I provide an example of how uh, following uh, is used, saying you know, we follow this exposition. Um, uh, a technique uh, in which you can cite an author and a details of a source such as the page. Um, this is a quoted block of text showing, okay, I'm, I'm quoting this text, it's too big for a quote um, such as is applied here uh, and instead I, I indent the text. And this is an example of image reuse. For example, you say figure taken from so-and-so, or in this case, this is the U of S thesis. It says source of the image was such and such. And, and again, you're going to want to attribute it. Where is it taken from? And you want to do more than do this, even with the, the quoting. Even if you're making a few words of change, that's still substantively the, what is taken, and you need to acknowledge it within a special, special fashion. Um, so reusing, uh, reusing text that's only locally modified, it's a big no-no without explicit recognition that this is what I'm doing. Okay. Time is, is running short. Uh, I provide another example of an adapted figure. Wikipedia, some of you are not unfamiliar with Wikipedia. <laughs> and you have to be very cautious about what things are written there. Um, there are some pages of Wikipedia that are battles between two different ways of viewing things. But there's a means in Wikipedia, if you really want to cite something there, you can, when you say download, you can say 
click on this, you need to attribute the author and it will actually show you how to give a proper attribution to that. Now, within recent years, there have been profound technological shifts and technology has basically allowed it to be very easy to copy things. So you have to be careful, especially careful. You want to be especially careful taking accidentally taking text and forgetting it was borrowed. So yeah. When is this class supposed to end? So it's ending at 4.30? But, but another class is starting is after 4.30 and I need to set it up. Okay, okay, so uh, you can begin uh, setting up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, within this context, you will want to make sure that if you borrow material from, um, from a, uh, a source into your notes, that you will want to, in your notes, record the fact that this is borrowed material. Okay? And finally, I will just note that behind all these discoveries are two formidable tools. The least formidable tool is plagiarism detectors, and the most, the most formidable tool is the memory and the senses of the faculty members involved. So ladies and gentlemen, I have a set of slides. I will distribute it. I have further a, a process here by which these sorts of cases are pursued with at the U of, within the U of S that gives you a sense of what happens if um, uh, misbehavior of this sort is discovered. I further would note that I will, um, I'm making a recording and I will provide a, um, uh, an online version of this recording for anyone who wishes to review it more, more closely. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.